With the election of George W. Bush as president in 2000, the U.S. moved towards a more aggressive policy toward Iraq. Despite the Bush administration's stated interest in invading Iraq, little formal movement towards an invasion occurred until the 11th of September attacks. On September 20, 2001, Bush addressed a joint session of Congress, and announced his new war on terror. Allegations of a connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda were made by some U.S. government officials who asserted that a highly secretive relationship existed between Saddam and the radical Islamist militant organization Al-Qaeda from 1992 to 2003. The rationale for invading Iraq as a response to the 11th of September attacks has been widely questioned. As there was no cooperation between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. In November 2002, President George W. Bush, visiting Europe for a NATO summit, declared that should Iraqi President Saddam Hussein choose not to disarm, the United States will lead a coalition of the willing to disarm him. All the decades of deceit and cruelty have now reached an end. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. The coalition included 49 members, but only six members involved in the invasion. From 1992 to the United States-led coalition invasion of Iraq in 2003, there were two no-fly zones in Iraq. The no-fly zone in the north of Iraq was established shortly after the Gulf War. In August 1992 the no-fly zone in the south was established. From 1992 to 2002, the United States and the United Kingdom launched airstrikes on strategic and military locations and oil fields. On March 19, 2003 at 9 p.m., the first strike of the operation was carried out by Special Operations Aviation Regiment. Within seven hours, more than 70 sites were destroyed, effectively depriving the Iraqi military of any early warning of the coming invasion. As the sites were eliminated, the first Helleborn Special Forces teams launched from H-5 Air Base in Jordan. On March 20, 2003 approximately at 5.33 local time, explosions were heard in Baghdad. Special Operations Commandos infiltrated throughout Iraq and called in the early airstrikes. At 10.16 p.m., George W. Bush announced that he had ordered an attack against selected targets of military importance in Iraq. When this word was given, the troops on standby crossed the border into Iraq. The oil infrastructure of Iraq was rapidly seized and secured with limited damage at that time. Securing the oil infrastructure was considered of great importance. In the first Gulf War, while retreating from Kuwait, the Iraqi army had set many oil wells on fire and had dumped oil into the Gulf waters. This was to disguise troop movements and to distract coalition forces. Before the 2003 invasion, Iraqi forces had mined some 400 oil wells around Basra and the al Fa Peninsula with explosives. Coalition troops launched an air and amphibious assault on the al Fa Peninsula during the closing hours of 19th of March to secure the oil fields there. British 3 Commando Brigade, with the United States Marine Corps and the Polish Special Forces, attacked the port of Umm Qasr. There they met with heavy resistance by Iraqi troops. A total of 14 coalition troops and 30 to 40 Iraqi troops were killed, and 450 Iraqis taken prisoner. The British Army's 16 Air Assault Brigade also secured the oil fields in southern Iraq in places like Rumaila while the Polish commandos captured offshore oil platforms near the port. Despite the rapid advance of the invasion forces, some 44 oil wells were destroyed and set ablaze by Iraqi explosives or by incidental fire. However, the wells were quickly capped and the fires put out, preventing the ecological damage and loss of oil production capacity that had occurred at the end of the Gulf War. In keeping with the rapid advance plan, the U.S. 3rd Infantry Division moved westward and then northward through the western desert toward Baghdad. While the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force moved along Highway 1 through the center of the country, and 1 Armored Division moved northward through the eastern marshland. Initially, the 1st Marine Division fought through the Rumaila oil fields, and moved north to Nasiriya, a moderate-sized, Shiite-dominated city with important strategic significance as a major road junction and its proximity to nearby Dalil airfield. It was also situated near a number of strategically important bridges over the Euphrates River. 
the United States Army 3rd Infantry Division defeated Iraqi forces entrenched in and around the airfield and bypassed the city to the west. By 24 March Nasiriya captured, coalition forces gained an important logistical center in southern Iraq. Another fierce battle was at Najaf, where U.S. airborne and armored units with British air support fought an intense battle with Iraqi units. By 4 April, Iraqi forces defeated after several days of heavy fighting. The Iraqi port city of Umm Qasr was the first British obstacle. A joint Polish-British-American force ran into unexpectedly stiff resistance, and it took several days to clear the Iraqi forces out. Farther north, the British 7 Armored Brigade, fought their way into Iraq's second-largest city, Basra. On 6 April after two weeks of fierce fighting, entering Basra was achieved. The Karbala Gap was a 20-25 mile wide strip of land with the Euphrates River to the east and Lake Rezaza to the west. This strip of land was recognized by Iraqi commanders as a key approach to Baghdad and was defended by some of the best units of the Iraqi Republican Guard. The coalition had since the beginning of March been conducting a strategic deception operation to convince the Iraqis that the U.S. 4th Infantry Division would be mounting a major assault into northern Iraq from Turkey. This deception plan worked, and on 2 April Saddam's son Qusay Hussein declared that the American invasion from the south was a feint and ordered troops to be redeployed from the Karbala front to the north of Baghdad. Because of this mistake, the coalition units had an easy job to break through the Iraqi army and move toward Baghdad. Three weeks into the invasion, the army's 3rd Infantry Division, with the 1st Marine Division also present, moved into Baghdad. Units of the Iraqi Special Republican Guard led the defense of the city. Initial plans were for coalition units to surround the city and gradually move in, forcing Iraqi armor and ground units to cluster into a central pocket in the city and then attack with air and artillery forces. This plan soon became unnecessary. As an initial engagement of armored units south of the city saw most of the Republican Guard's assets destroyed and routes in the southern outskirts of the city occupied. The fall of Baghdad saw the outbreak of regional, sectarian violence throughout the country, as Iraqi tribes and cities began to fight each other over old grudges. The Iraqi cities of al Qut and the Syria launched attacks on each other immediately following the fall of Baghdad to establish dominance in the new country. And the U.S.-led coalition quickly found themselves embroiled in a potential civil war. U.S.-led coalition forces ordered the cities to cease hostilities immediately, explaining that Baghdad would remain the capital of the new Iraqi government. On May 1, 2003, Bush landed on the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln where he gave a speech announcing the end of major combat operations in the Iraq war. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed.